please speak as you might to a young child or a golden retriever. It's an unfair game. They're schemers. Schemers trying to control their little worlds. The rich get richer, that's the law of the land. It's just money. Blasphemy! This is madness! I drink your milkshake! Mr. Brent Johnson, it's a pleasure to see your face again for the fourth time this week. We are two busy finance bros, and uh, here we are doing a um, full-length episode, even though our recent Madness edition um, post was quite long as well. So we're rolling into uh, the start of the weekend. It's been a interesting week so far. There's a lot for us to talk about. One of the first things I wanted to bring up um, to kind of move us into the, the overall uh, depth of conversation we're going to have here is we, as I just mentioned, we just posted this, this madness edition, which is, it's the second installment where you and I get to kind of return to some of what started this whole thing for us. Like, you know, us having fun conversations at the end of the week, sometimes over tequila, sometimes over a coffee. And, we you know, brought this madness edition into the fold where we get to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in markets, the more personal side of things. Um, we labeled it madness edition because we know some people are just so market obsessed that that's all they want. And you know, recently on, on this most, uh, the, the, the episode we just published, there was a comment saying, hey, you, know, you guys have fun with your madness thing, but I'm gonna hang back and wait for your, your market stuff. But the, the, the human, element to all of this is, is so important and it's it's such a key driver of markets and one of the things i've started to notice um, not only like we highlighted in, in in the world and in society there's these tensions and conflicts that are going on but for so long as you've been talking about there's tension and conflict between the doves and the hawks the bulls and the bears for the first time it feels like this week the sentiment is starting to shift and people for you know, who've been carrying more of that bullish tone have started to show some signs of fatigue. Uh, are you noticing some of the, the trend shift perhaps in, in where positioning is or, or just, you know, the, the narrative? Well, it's kind of amazing how quickly it's changed. And I shouldn't say it's amazing because this is how it always happens, right? Uh, you know, you, you finally get that last person, you know, to jump in the pool and then all hell breaks loose. And I don't, I don't think it would be fair to say all hell has broken loose yet, but you know, I'll just, I'll take it back. You know, at the very beginning of the year, just a one very simple indicator is the put call ratio. And, and at the very beginning of the year, the put call ratio was, um, you know, the highest it had ever been. And, you know, we talked about how that could potentially lead to a short squeeze because positioning was offsides and, and that's exactly what happened. And then, you know, as of a month ago, it was completely reversed and it was back to its all-time low uh, because everybody was now in the market, right? And there was nobody willing to buy puts anymore. And sure enough, you know, about that time, within a week of that kind of high coming in on the put call ratio or the, the low coming in, the market started to roll over. And, you know, since that time, the I think the Dow is off 3%. And the Nasdaq's maybe off six percent, so they've pulled back. They haven't crashed, but they've pulled back. And just in the last couple of days, that put call ratio has dramatically swung, and now it, I don't think it's back to its high, but it's getting back up there again. So uh, it, it just kind of shows me that even the people that jumped in within the last month probably knew when they were jumping in they shouldn't do it, right? It's like you just know, <laughs> you, you, you just. But the FOMO is just killing you. And you just can't help it and you jump in and then sure enough everything rolls over and i think a lot of them are very quickly you know repositioning either out or buying protection or whatever it is so um it, 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 people who think that 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 investing or trading is all about you know mechanics or understanding the fundamentals or learning how to read a chart or learning how to read a you know a financial statement i mean it's much more important to understand psychology and especially your own psychology than it is to understand all that other stuff. That other stuff's important and you need to know how to do that. But the, you know, the six inches between your ears is probably the most important, <laughs> is probably the most important thing to understand out of all of it. Or the, that six inch organ in, in your chest that's uh, 
sometimes driving the decision more than the one between your head. Yep. And let, let's just leave it right there with body parts. Let's not let, let's not move anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, about... speaking of uh, no I'm just kidding <laughs> um, so as we were talking about sentiment and the human aspect to some of this you know people are always searching for the narrative and I feel like for the, the, the overall boom and bust cycle narratives China always finds its way in, into both of those and I think you know the last couple of times we've had big res uh, recessionary events um, specifically the GFC, you know, the, the Chinese or China credit impulse was a big part of that recovery. Uh, you know, it's, it's a new world that, you know, the supply chain disruptions and, and people becoming more nationalistic, uh, both politically and geopolitically, as well as just in terms of, of business operations. Um, it seems like China is, is struggling to kind of not only for themselves, but for the rest of the world, be that credit engine that keeps the market going um, at, at a time when things feel like they're slowing across the globe. Now, there's a couple of things that you mentioned just a, a moment ago that I want to highlight on before I pass the mic off to you. The put call ratio is interesting. You, you mentioned that earlier in the year when it was lopsided one way and then it's kind of come back the other direction. Um, we have put some emphasis on FOMO uh, in a couple episodes. Now, a, a few weeks ago, we did have a conversation that we, we revisited a conversation we had in the beginning of the year for an episode called um, Japanese Jawbone Roulette. Just recently, we did one with the, the title Hell is Coming, and, and we talked about various aspects of, the, of these uh, forthcoming downward pressures on markets, and we revisited that Japanese carry trade and the, and the role that the yen plays. Do you want to kind of put in a similar, encapsulate in a similar way the, the role that China is playing and and I won't get into specifics yet until you kind of share your thoughts, yeah. but there are certain things that are that are that are starting to come apart in, in China at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And the first thing I'll say as we get in there is that, you know, a lot of times in order to keep, you know, this show kind of on a certain track and and to and to have a certain flow to it, we'll come up with topics, right? And we'll talk about certain things. But it's important to remember that all of this stuff is connected. So you can't just focus on China. You can't just focus on the yen. You can't just focus on the put call ratio. You can't just focus on psychology. And you know what happens in California affects what happens in Tokyo, and it affects what happens in Frankfurt. And so it's really, especially when you're talking about macro events, um, you know, it, it's hard to you know just isolate one piece of the pie. Now, if the whole world is trending up or trending down in one direction, then you can kind of focus in on one little industry or something. But I think right now, macro is more important than ever. And because macro is so intertwined with each other, even though you might be talking about the yen, the yuan in China is part of it, and the dollar is part of it, and the euro is part of it. So, you know, as we've talked about Japan a lot this year, um, it, it's been my view that the yen is kind of a key driver. Like, I think the yen and the dollar are the two most important things right now. But part of the reason I think the yen is so important is the influence it has on the yuan, right? And so, and, and the yuan is kind of loosely pegged to the dollar. Not exactly. Um, it's very kind of a floating band. But, you know, they, for in 2015, they did this kind of mini deval from the dollar. And then from there, they kind of pegged it to a basket and a, kind of this loose basket. But since then, the, the yuan has been weakening. And, Part of the issue with the yen getting so weak is that it puts pressure on the yuan, and so then the yuan tries to weaken because they're they're you know they're they're, they're regional competitors and they're both exporters, and so you know if, if if Japanese goods are less expensive, then people buy more Japanese goods. Well, then that puts more pressure on China, and so that's why we've said the 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 weakness of the yen has put pressure on China, and not only that, but China has to import a lot of of their basic inputs for their economy. They have to import a lot of food. They have to import a lot of energy. They have to import water. So they, you know, they don't have a lot of the basic inputs that perhaps the United States has, right? And so as, and because commodities trade in dollars, and I know that people will say, but they're starting to trade in yuan. Yeah, they are starting to be able to buy some commodities to a very small extent in yuan, but they still, have to buy a lot of these in dollars. 
And so over the last year, as the dollar has gotten stronger and the yuan has gotten weaker, and we've had higher prices of commodities for a while because of the effects from COVID, then they were having higher costs to import these very important needed inputs, right? But at the same time, so they were having, you know, they were having inflationary pressures and needed inputs. But at the same time, they're having deflationary pressures from a deleveraging event in their in their real estate market. And so, you know, they're kind of they've kind of got this damned if you do, damned if you don't. If they if they weaken the yuan in order to support the real estate market, it makes their input costs even more expensive. If they strengthen the yuan to to make their import costs less expensive, then the real estate market comes under pressure. And not only that, but they had they, they have uh, their their real estate market has a lot of U.S. dollar based debt leverage in it. And so, as the dollar has been stronger, that's put pressure on them. And so, it's really kind of the worst of all worlds. Now, within all of this, and part of the reason overall markets have had a pretty good year so far is part of this narrative that China was finally going to reopen. So, you know, a lot of the world reopened, let's call it 12 to 18 months ago, right? Uh, but China didn't. China kind of still had lockdowns. They, you know, they, they, they weren't allowing import, you know, imports and exports to the same extent they were pre-COVID. But the whole idea going into the kind of the end of the year and the beginning of this year was China was going to reopen and they were going to do a credit stimulus. They were going to provide liquidity to the banks and to the industries. And then that was going to kickstart a growth trend. And so, you know, that, that has been a tailwind for the markets. Um, but, you know, going into March, April, it hadn't really materialized too much. Well, so then you know, people started to kind of question the narrative a little bit. So then the job owning from the PBOC was, oh, no, no we're, we really are going to do it. We really are going to reopen. We really are going to stimulate. And so they, they've been they've been stimulating. They've been easing um, the reserve requirements for banks. They've basically been doing the exact opposite of what the United States has. They've been doing easy monetary policy as a, compared to the tight monetary policy of the United States. And as a result, the yuan just keeps getting weaker and weaker. And so, and as, and as the dollar gets stronger versus the yuan, and they've tried to do the stimulus and the stimulus just hasn't worked, their real estate companies, a couple of them, Country Garden and, and, and Evergrande have come under extreme pressure. And these are two of their biggest real estate developers. Uh, Evergrande just filed for bankruptcy protection in the United States for all their US dollar-based debt. And Country Garden is, is, I think they, I think they're in the grace period on their debt payment. So they haven't technically missed it yet and, and they haven't technically defaulted, but it, it's getting close to it. And so all of the, you know, and, and here's the thing is if, if we do get a massive default situation in the Chinese real estate market, <clears throat> which is probably the biggest market in the world outside of foreign exchange. I don't know how many trillions it is, but it's it's tens of trillions, right? So if there, if there ends up being a hole in that market and you get a credit contraction in that market, one of the ways that China would potentially counteract that would be to do an overnight or some kind of massive deval of the yuan, provide a you know, massive bailout to that industry, and they would do that by you know, quote unquote, printing yuan or, or devaluing the yuan, making it easier for those to pay off those debts. Uh, but that would, that would massively depreciate the yuan. So, and what they would be doing by devaluing the yuan, it would be pulling inflation into China to counteract the deflation that's already in China. So think of it like that. They're pulling inflation. Well, if they're pulling in inflation, they're trying to export their deflation. Okay, so if they do that, if they devalue the yuan, that sends a deflationary wave to the rest of the world. And in that situation, the dollar rises dramatically. And we all know what happened last year, and we all know what happened in 2020, and we all know what happened in 2008 when you get a massive rise in the dollar. So this is why, um, you know, pe people talk about how the, you know, you can't taper a Ponzi. And they often say that with regard to the United States. But the reality is, is all countries run the same system. And this is kind of one of my points is like, 
you can yell at the Fed and the United States dollar and the way that they have their monetary system all you want, but just recognize everybody else is doing the same thing. And so China is kind of in the in the place that everybody thinks that the United States is eventually going to get into and going to have to bail out all these industries, have to devalue the dollar. That's where China is right now today. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to do it tomorrow, but that's the point is that's what they're struggling with right now. And so if they if they do that, then they're going to be exporting that deflation and that that then sends the dollar higher and then you get in these situations like okay so then that puts pressure on united states industries and so then the united states industries you know they have to start selling assets okay now that they start selling assets you know now now you get markdowns on commercial real estate right so you could this is my point like it's all related you know we can't just talk about the yen you can't just talk about china you can't just talk about the dollar because it's all related but but the the, the point is is there is a massive hole in the Chinese real estate market. How they end up dealing with that, I don't know. But they're, you know, they're, China's reopening and counteroffensive against their deflationary pressures is kind of like the Ukraine counteroffensive against Russia. You know, it got all these headlines, everybody's talking about it, but it hasn't really amounted to much. And now people, or even those in the West, are even starting to say, you know, this counteroffensive hasn't really worked. While well, people in the West are starting to say about the China reopening, you know what? This hasn't really worked despite their best efforts. And so what's the result? And I, I don't know what the result is, but it doesn't seem to be on a good path. And if, it, again, if you end up having a hole or some kind of a deleveraging event in the largest market in the world, that is a definite headwind. Whether it becomes a crisis, I don't know. I'm prepared for it, but it has the potential to be a massive crisis. Well, before China ends up fighting any kind of war in Taiwan, they, they clearly have to tackle this war at home with the housing market, deflation, et cetera. You know, you mentioned Country Garden, um, Evergrande, the payment delinquency, we'll call it, issues that they're having. But there's actually been a little bit more, which kind of goes into this liquidity conversation as well liquidity and you've mentioned it yourself it is really what drives markets and it's probably one of the problems that china is trying to figure out because to inject more liquidity you want to devalue the currency but then it has all these other knock-on effects that you just referenced but two of their biggest uh shadow banking entities or maybe a better way of describing that would be like a non-bank lender it's it's well known that they're liquidity providers in the space whether it's through leverage or collateralizing assets I'm gonna do my best Mandarin here. So one is uh, Zhang Zhu and the other is Zhu Rong. So these are, the the latter I just mentioned is referred to as China's Blackstone. And they yep. have just recently skipped payments on, on a number of investment products. So now it starts to trickle into the average Joe's pocket. Um, and this goes back to sentiment, which we talked about at the beginning of this episode. And this goes back to, the things that we we're discussing in the Madness Edition episode where, you know, the average person's about to, you know, has been slowly taking it on the chin and it's it's the 10th round and, and, and they're just tired of fighting the battle. Yeah, and, and this is the issue. Like now that these investment products are starting to, to be affected, that could lead to people selling these investment products. And, and, and think back to what happened in the U.S. in March, right? When people started selling their investments or withdrawing their money from their banks. And then the banks had to liquidate securities that were under, they, they had holding these securities at mark to market or at mark to maturity. And then when they have to start marking them to market as they get liquidated, it caused a hole in the banking system. This exact same thing is in danger of happening in China. And they don't, if they have to start liquidating securities because people no longer want to stay invested in them and they, and the people start taking their money out of the banks, then that causes a liquidity crisis with China, right? Which is exacerbates what they're trying to avoid. And not only that, like uh, I don't have the headline right in front of me, um, but over the last week, the you know there was even some headlines where the 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 PBOC was uh, telling the banks that you know no sales, no sales of investment products, you know, basically locking down the accounts to where you couldn't get liquidity, and so. You know that that could go on for a while, but it can't go go on forever. And long story short, there's just a lot of problems. We we've talked about the the the, the problems in China for a long time. They seem to be coming to a head. It's it, I, I'm not sure how it's going to be resolved, but it's it's it, I I don't think it's going to be resolved in a non volatile way. Let me put it that way. 
Well, speaking of liquidity, we, you know, how much of it is true? Another topic we talked about just a, a day ago or two days ago um, in the Madness Edition. You can tell we're really pushing you towards that episode. Um, it was fun <laughs> and it was a little frightening, but um, we there was a headline about student debt forgiveness again. Um, how much of this actually happens? Who who gets to participate? Um, we'll all find out at some point, I suppose. But I bring that up partly because of liquidity, and partly because you. You were on a roll this week um, between things that you participated in, the number of times you and I had a chat and, and uh, published a video, uh, but you were super active on Twitter and I think in, in your sweet spot, right, in the zone, which is all about this, the, the, the global monetary system, the, the dollar's role in that system, the role it plays for you know, providing liquidity. And so you have this student loan forgiveness thing, which ultimately is um, deleveraging or debt destruction. And you have made the point over and over, especially this week, that any type of de-dollarization, the, the, the constant um, end of the dollar fear mongering and, and calling for you know, something like a BRICS currency to replace it, that whole process is not something that you, know, you don't think can happen. In fact, you say it invent eventually it will. It's just don't think it's going to happen overnight and not without significant amounts of pain because de-dollarizing is at the core deleveraging. And like you said, you can't taper a Ponzi and all of these systems are debt-based and you start destroying debt, the, the, the entire Jenga board starts to come down. So when you're looking at the student loan forgiveness thing, just as an example, is that at least maybe temporarily a bit of stealth liquidity because now people don't have to worry about making those payments or at the end when it's all washed out is that just more deleveraging sucking up more dollars from the system and making the system more fragile well it, it this is where the devil's in the details kind of comes in right and, and and i don't i don't know i'll admit i don't know all the details of the biden plan and and how they would potentially do this and i'm not even sure that they know and part of the reason I think that, you know, this is part of the reason why politicians are always a little bit cagey is some of them might be legal, some of them might be not. They might have to change a law in order to be able to do it the way they want to do it. It may, you know, they may float the idea and then it, the, they get so much political pushback, they change the way it's done. So it kind of depends on the way they would potentially do it. So on the one hand, there would be extra liquidity because if, you know, if I'm a, you know, somebody who's been out of school for 10 years, and I still have student loans to pay. And instead of paying a thousand dollars on my student loan, I don't have to pay that anymore. Well, that gives me a thousand dollars to go on a trip or, you know, paint my house or buy a refrigerator or whatever it is. So that that's stimulus, right? Um, but if the way that that is paid for is that the Biden administration and the Congress says to the banks, well, you were stupid, you loaned them the money and you know, you, you were, you shouldn't have. And now that's a defaulted loan for you. And so, in that case, money is destroyed because now the the bank balance sheet gets impaired, right? And thus now the bank has the uh, less ability to extend new credit. And if you can't extend new credit, then the bank then the banking system starts to have a credit contraction, and the credit contraction means there's less dollars, not more. Um, but if, on the other hand, the government says, "Well, you know, of course you didn't know that we were going to change the law and say that they didn't have to pay off their student loans," so in exchange, we will give you the money and we will pay for the, the bailout. So in that case, um, it's net liquidity, right? Um, now, how, how, where does the government get the money to do that? Well, you know, are they borrowing it or are they, is, is, are they doing QE to then give it to the treasury? And so it, it kind of depends on where, how the, de the details are. But in general, if 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 it if it's a bailout, then it's net liquidity. And, but if it's a default, then it's 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 negative liquidity. So, um, but that is but that that's an issue, right? And then that's that's one of the headwinds that we've talked about is that this debt student debt deferment is is scheduled to roll off like I think in the next couple of weeks, sometime in the next month. And so if that debt deferment rolls off and these loans are not forgiven rather than being stimulus now that that's a headwind because now people have to start making those payments again you know for two or three years they haven't had to make those payments if they have to start making those payments again again now instead of putting gas in their car or buying the the refrigerator or taking that trip now they've got to start paying their student loans again so it would just be one more headwind um that the, that the economy runs up against well speaking of headwinds in the last part of our conversation here um 
your friend, Alex Jervich, he shared one of his investor letters recently. And in this letter, he talks about his thoughts on what actually caused the 9% inflation, 9% inflation um, that we saw this time last year. He talks probably more importantly, or the, uh, the emphasis or point he was making is the reduction in inflation that we've had and, and now being more in this 4% range actually has nothing to do with what the Fed's response has been since last year, which is the increase in interest rates and the tighter monetary policy. And so we talked about sentiment. We talked about things that you know maybe looked like tailwinds at one point starting to turn into headwinds and investor attitude towards risk starting to wane. Now you have an interesting uh, perspective shared from someone like Alex putting, putting into context the fact that inflation's kind of rolled over on, on its own is really the point here. And now the yep. Fed has raised almost 600 basis points. <laughs> you know, Every time we talk about Fed rate hikes and, hey, maybe things aren't quite as bad as they seem, and, and we're just trying to you know give both sides of the story and somewhat, hey, Powell never thought he could go this far. We'll oftentimes get comments that say, you know, look at the lag. You're ignoring the lag. And it's, no, we're not ignoring the lag. We know there's historically one that exists. So now we're, we're giving the, 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 lag, the lag boys a little bit of credit here, which is, you know, the interest rate hikes and the tighter monetary policy from the Fed um, has nothing to do or hasn't really made an impact on markets yet. So I'm going to bring that up as a point. Also going to mention the Fed GDP now, which is kind of like their their uh, GDP forecast, um, is forecasting almost six percent GDP. So we we know the Fed has such a, a wonderfully functional crystal ball. So I think that's kind of funny. And with those two things mentioned, I would love it too if you can wrap all of this up because we talked about Japan many times before and we, we use that to pivot into what's going on in China and how this is such an interesting macro world right now. You have been a, a little bit lately referencing some of the stuff that went on in October last year, you know, where the dollar was, was the strongest and you had all these things starting to break. The guilt market was under pressure. So this yep. kind of all, basically what I'm handing off to you here is some specific data points to reference, but, you know, kind of teeing you up for a, a milkshake um, highlight, so, so to speak. Yeah. So, so the first thing I will say is if you don't know who Alex Gurev, if you like what we're talking about, if you like this topic, if you like macro and you like thinking about these big issues and you don't know who Alex Gurevich is, then you should find out who Alex Gurevich is, is you should follow him on Twitter and read everything he writes. So I'm lucky enough that I, and he's written a couple of books. You should absolutely get the books and read his books. Um, he's literally in the top five smartest people I've ever met. Um, he's, he's brilliant. So just start off with that. So, and, and even if you don't agree with him, his thought process is, is excellent. So I, I would encourage you to kind of read his stuff, even if you have a different opinion. Um, and the second thing I would say is that Alex started talking about this 18 months ago. And, and he, on the one hand, he was dead right, but the result just hasn't happened yet. And I'll tell you what I mean. So in april of 2022 yeah right so so 18 months ago uh, or 15 months ago 16 months ago uh we were at a conference together in california we were at a real vision conference and we were sitting on a panel and you know th this is when inflation cpi prints were just really starting to accelerate right and they, they the the year over year numbers were starting to be like five six seven eight nine percent year over year and Everybody was talking about how, you know, the, uh, the in inflation was transitory. People were so stupid and, you know, they were clearly wrong. They didn't know what they were talking about. And th this was, the, I mean, this was the absolute, um, you know, this was the zeitgeist, right? This is what everybody was talking <laughs> about. The, tr the, the transition, the, 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 the inflation is transitory, you know, Yellen was stupid and Powell was stupid. And so, and everybody at the conference was saying the same thing. And Alex gets up on stage and he's, he says, my biggest concern is massive deflation. <laughs> and everybody's like, what? Huh? Right? They're like, and, and, and I knew exactly where he was going with this because again, once you kind of understand how the monetary system is designed, you understand that they typically go up, but you also understand that based on certain things, they can immediately 
crash. And that's what Alex was starting to talk about. And he was talking about, and I, and I will say, I have not read this, this letter that you're referencing. I, I plan to read it, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with his views. And so I'm, I'm going to base what I say based on his views as I understand it. So, but you know, everybody should read the letter for themselves. Um, the, the point was, is that a lot of the inflationary pressures that we saw coming out of COVID, it's not that the Fed, you know, cutting rates didn't influence it because clearly if they hadn't bailed out the markets, we would have had deflation, right? But the big part of it is that, you know, a lot of it had to do with just massive supply chain disruption. And if you have massive supply chain disruption and you cannot get supply of something, but you still have money to buy it, then the price goes up, right? And so, and, and, and so that, that's what a lot of the inflationary pressures are from. And his point was, okay, so now those are going to start to loosen the, you know, the supply chains are going to, the mech slaps are going to start to work themselves out. And meanwhile, we have the Fed, you know, in the middle of the fastest rate hiking cycle in history. And so I think his point then and his point now is the Fed, and, and this is, again, this all this stuff is related. You know, a lot of people say the Fed is not political. Complete bull****. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's no other way to say it. Is they, there was so much pressure on them to fight inflation, they could not do anything. If Powell had said, you know what, we think the inflationary pressures are largely a result of the supply chain issues related to COVID, and therefore we are not going to raise rates and we're just going to let the market work its way out. He would have been yanked out of his chair within a month by Biden and Congress and whoever it was, right? So the politicians are, do have an ability to they can't control monetary policy, but they can they can influence it. But anyway, so as a result, Powell, you know, Gert, Alex's point was that Powell is going to try to fight this inflation, even though he doesn't have to fight it, because the market is already starting to roll over on an inflation basis. And within two or three months from him saying that, it did. So it peaked, you know, it then peaked in June and July, and the inflation prints since then have gotten lower and lower and lower and lower. Now they haven't crashed and we have, we still have the high levels of readings. Uh, but part of the reason that the CPI readings have stayed high is because of housing and owner equivalent rents, which makes up 25% of the CPI calculation. If you look at other things, you know, food prices have come down, you know, gas prices stabilized and, you know, they came, they went down, they've come back up a little bit. Oil was lower. So Alec, you know, to Alex's point is inflationary pressures did start to come down. And, and if you just look at the market-based data, the Fed did not need to keep hiking at that same level. And they certainly don't need to be hiking now. And I think if I'm guessing this is what the letter says, um, is that he thinks that as we've talked about, there is going to come a point where these rate hikes, and that's the other thing, we've talked about the lag of the rate hikes. And so his his point is that, you know, interest rates have been hiked 500% in, in, in the 12 months. And now that things are starting to get refinanced, you know, they didn't get refinanced last year, or maybe they didn't get refinanced in September or December. But now as things are starting to get refinanced at, you know, 500% higher rates than they were, you know, 18 months ago, that's going to be a big liquidity squeeze because now everybody's capital is going to have to go to pay interest on the debt as opposed to whatever else they were doing previously. And then that is going to cause, have we've talked about running into the wall, right? We, we've talked about how high interest rates are stimulative until you have to refinance and you hit the wall, right? And so if we hit that wall and interest rates are that much higher, it, 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 it has the potential to not just cause a slowdown, but to cause a liquidity evaporation. And yeah, we started to see that with the banks in March. And so that's why I think he, that's why he is saying that, you know, the, the hikes that Powell has done over the last year are orders of magnitude tighter than the markets would have deemed necessary. And so 
that's how you get a big liquidity squeeze in, in a crisis. And it's kind of related to the same thing that's happening in China, right? China's hitting that point now, and Alex is saying that we are going to hit it as well. Yeah, and, and you, you again, busy week for you. You had a conversation with the gentleman over at Simplify. Um, I really enjoyed that one. I mean, having a the, you and Mike Green uh, banter back and forth is is always a fun thing to be uh, present for. Now, one of the points that and Mike is very, very deep in, in the devil of the details, right? He's he can split a, a chart like it's a piece of hair, right? So he's yeah. Um, one of the points he's talking about to kind of reinforce everything you just said has to do with volumes. The, the volumes are are so poor right now, and specifically housing. I mean, it's an easier one I think for people to conceptualize because everyone can see that houses aren't selling, people aren't moving interest rates hit a 21 year high they're they're sticky around 7% the last week and a half and at some point when you look at the you know the low transaction volume because right now there aren't any kind of um, there there isn't a huge flow of sellers looking to exit so therefore the pricing pressure gets to exist on the upper band but as soon as that reverses you, you don't have the, the the buyer support there. So as soon as you have an uptick in, in sellers, those prices can decline very, very rapidly. So in an illiquid market where there isn't a lot of volume, and this goes across the equity markets as well, it's, it's kind of that smoke before the fire because as soon as sentiment, again, a big point of this conversation, what we highlighted early on, as soon as that sentiment shifts, there's nothing there to catch that falling knife and you hit these, these air pockets. Is that also something when you're referencing the last 12 months and you look at what you know was happening in October, some of these liquidity issues, do you see that creating um, you know, a, a rising dollar effect considering what's going on in, in, in global markets? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the thing is, again, I wish I knew how to time this perfectly. You know, I, I just don't, I, but, I, but what I do know is high rates are stimulative until you hit the wall. And so I, I, I think you can participate in markets, but you always have to have a plan you know, to, to, on how you're going to protect on the downside. And so the reason this is so important is for the exact reasons that's now showing up in Japan, I'm sorry, in China, for the exact reasons that Alex is talking about and the exact reasons that Mike is talking about. And the example we can use again is the what happened with the banks in March. Once somebody had to sell because clients wanted their cash back, you know, they couldn't mark to maturity anymore. They had to mark it to the, the last sale price. And then that creates a very kind of a, it can create a cascade where everybody else has to do the same thing. And so I think that's what Alex is talking about. That's what Mike is talking about. And, you know, so I have, I have a friend who owns a bunch of apartments in New York City. I was talking to him this morning, another very smart guy. <laughs> Um, and, and he was telling me, he's like, listen, I, he says, he says, I own enough apartments that I have to do a new lease, uh, every month. I have, I go through lease negotiations at least once a month. He says, I can tell you, I have not had anybody trying to negotiate lower and I have plenty of people applying to come in at a higher price. And he says, rents aren't falling. And I tend to, you know, and, and his point's a good one. Like there's no decreasing pressure on the rents, but <laughs> If we hit the wall and people start to get laid off and those new people wanting to come in and pay the higher rate dry up, and then one person misses a rent payment and then somebody gets priced lower, it's just like we were talking last week with the commercial real estate in San Francisco. Nobody wants to sell, nobody wants to sell. They put it off, they put it off. Then finally somebody sells 60% off, right? Now that affects everybody else. And so it's kind of the same thing. And the reason this is important is because rents or owner occupied rent, however, you know, is, is a 25% piece of the CPI. So until that comes down, CPI, even if gas, even if oil were to fall 20%, if owner occupied rent doesn't, then CPI is probably not going to fall significantly. On the flip side, if owner occupied rent fell, 30%, which it could if we hit the wall and gas prices go up 25%, it ain't going to matter because CPI is still going to be coming down because the owner occupied rent will dominate the, 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 the three or four or 5% or maybe is, is energy five or 6%. I can't remember, but it, but it's much higher. It's like four times as high 
uh, as as energy. So you know, energy would have to have a four times as big a percent move to offset you know the owner equivalent rent coming down. And so this is, I think this is Mike's point, and this is Alex's point, is that they believe that the market is underneath things, that the market is slowing down, and that while they understand that nobody has had to sell yet, when they do have to sell, it can create a cascade very quickly, and liquidity can go from plentiful to not just less, but like gone. And, and, and that is the nature of our system. That is the nature of a fractional reserved debt-based monetary system. When people start to pull capital, money literally disappears because money isn't real. It's like all ephemeral, right? It's all like digital. It's just, it's the, you know, and, and it's just gone. It's just gone. And so, and so that's, that's why you can be humming along and everything's going fine. And then literally you get hit up, you know, you're getting hit inside the head with a two by four and you know, you're 25% lower than you were the day before. I think we got an awesome soundbite there that we can, it's just gone. It's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you see, did you see, um, did you see the second Wall Street movie, Wall Street 2, Money Never it, Sleeps? Yeah, I can't quite remember. The, so there's this old yeah. guy and he does that. He goes, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't do the same whistle, but uh, that, that's what I had going in my mind. I'm, I'm disappointed as a country boy. You, you don't have a, you know, a, a variety of whistles. But, um, you know, it's it's interesting referencing the wall because back to the letter from Gervich, you have, um, you know, investors on a path, the economy on a path. And in our, you know, site view on the horizon, we don't see a wall. And to his point, this 6% or 5.5% increase in Fed funds rate is more or less the Fed all of a sudden erecting a wall uh, r rather yeah. quickly right when the, the economy is not expecting it. So <laughs> things are already kind of getting exhausted and slowing down and then boom, all of a sudden these, these, the rate hikes finally take hold and it's like an anchor, yeah. um, an anchor around your weight. So that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to highlight here is, is it's all fun and games until it's not. And then it's, it's gone, it's gone. And, uh, <laughs> well, and it really is a wall too, because if you think about it, if, if, Let's just let's just use one percent. If if a year ago rates were one percent, and you didn't have to refinance, and then this year you had to refinance and rates were two percent, that's still a hundred percent. That's double. You know, the the interest cost is now double. That's you know, it's it's significant, but it's not the end of the world. But if they were one percent and now they're five percent or six percent, and now your interest payment is four or five times what it was a year ago, that's a that's a wall. Right, and that's not just a little speed bump. That's a wall. That's like you, you know, your your car is literally running into the wall, and um, you know, bad things happen when 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 cars hit walls. So um, you know, and and we're we've at. yeah, we and we've we have over the last couple conversations just brought to attention these these factors, right? And it's and we're not making predictions that the end of the world is here tomorrow. I think um, you know these narratives are an important way to start to build a comprehension about all the factors that are in play. But it does feel like even just this week, sentiment has shifted a bit. Um, you know, China is, is having some real issues. That deflation gets exported into the world. You know, our banking system is, is kind of on its own um, bailout, if you will, and, and stealth QE yep. with the bank term funding program. So it, it feels like, you know, you, you've said too recently that, bad things tend to happen in the fall. So we're not making any predictions here, but we're, we're definitely enthusiastically watching, you know, these slowly changing events. Um, and one last point I'd like to add is that these data sets, whether you love them or not, doesn't change the fact that they're relevant, that the market is making measurements around them. They're making, uh, playing expectations around them. So we get that the CPI is a crappy measurement of inflation and we get that your food is still expensive and things are out of control. That's that's not the point here. We don't yeah. love the data sets either. It's just in terms of the measurement that everyone is using, those measuring yep. sticks are changing real time um, right now and they could change much faster than they have been, particularly in, in the real estate portion of the CPI as, as you discussed. So uh, I think this is a good point to wrap it up, Brent. Um, there was a lot happening this week, so I'm glad that uh, we took the time and, and ran a little long on this episode to discuss them all. For anyone who's uh, new to us, you know we are doing multiple videos a week. 
but each one of those videos has an objective. We do a Monday peak at the week. We do a midweek update. Uh, I reference a couple times the madness edition that we do at the end of the week. And then we have our full length um, episode, which we're recording right now. And uh, some point during the week, usually on a Tuesday, I will share a clip from one of those episodes. So depending on what you're looking for, the type of conversation, uh, how much and how frequently you want to keep up with us, those videos are structured in a way so that you can kind of work through them like in any any kind of series that you would watch. You're not just jumping in with us randomly and trying to keep up with, with the rhetoric. There's a, an objective in, in each one of those episodes. So um, I'll leave it at that. You can find my friend here, Brent Johnson, on Twitter at Santiago AU Fund. You can find me at John Katsmita. Uh, visit our website at milkshakespod.com. There's more information there and lots of fun stuff, including all those playlists and different types of uh, videos I just described on our YouTube channel at Milkshakes Pod. Uh, Brent, I think that'll do it for us. Any last words? No, the only thing I would say is I should have said this earlier is that I do think that the the uh, the interview I did with uh, Simplify uh, was one of the better ones because I think it kind of honed in on the message that uh, that I've tried to to get across to people. So for anybody that was interested in this conversation um, and, and wants to dig into that a little bit deeper, you know, I know John had tweeted that out as well. So um, go find that, and uh, it, it was a pretty good interview. And and I appreciate you bringing that up because. Um, our shows have timestamp chapters in them. Um, and I know a lot of people just click the video, get started and, and just kind of go through a, a, as it goes. But sometimes it's worth, you know, taking a look at the additional details of the description underneath the video, um, because there are things like various external links and, and points of reference that we make that I do put in there. And so I'll add a link to that uh, video so everyone can, can jump to it easily. All right. Well, I appreciate you um, adding that a little extra resource, Brent, and I appreciate everyone for joining us. That'll do it. And we'll see you guys in a couple of days. Um. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.